Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rebecca Gotham of Marielle, and along with my teammates, Julie Larson and Mark Boyk, we are excited and honored to present this breakout session of angel funding. We are going to have four speakers on the agenda today. Um, first, we're going to have Dr. Kent Weigel, then Dr. Heather White, both of Wisconsin Department of Dairy Science here in Madison. They will not be talking about their typical lecture topics of genomics and metabolism, but of something totally different. And then we we'll also be having Stacy Williams and also Michael Erdman um, speak as well. And this session is not your typical breakout session. Um, this topic of angel funding for the dairy industry was actually born last year at the time when Dairy Strong was going on. And so they will pre be presenting this idea and hopefully it'll be an interactive and informative session. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, thanks for the opportunity to visit this morning. And um, what I'd like to talk about, is, again, is something a little bit different from genomics. It's about how can we continue to deliver research and development and discoveries to Wisconsin dairy farmers? And also, how can we do it more efficiently? Okay, I'm gonna give a little bit of background and then I'm gonna hand it over to Heather White for sort of the, so I'm, I'm the appetizer. Heather is the main course and uh, Michael and Stacy are dessert. So, um, so to outline, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done historically, talk about the current model for research and development uh, how it gets done, the timeline, that's where we'll hand off to Heather. She'll talk about some of the ways to make it better, and then we'll hand it over to the financial folks to uh, talk about something that neither Heather or, nor I are qualified to talk about. So they won't talk about dairy cattle genetics and uh, fatty liver disease and things like that, and, and uh, we won't talk about money. So a lot of stuff here. I'm not going to read all these to you. Uh, you should thank me for that. But, but this is a, a poster that uh, George Shook and a couple other um, emeritus professors put together a couple years ago. Just to give the background, I want to make a couple of key points here, okay? Um, so how many uh, uh, corporate uh, people do we have here from companies? Mar Marielle, some others. Okay, how many of you have in your company research and development uh, team? Okay, you know, dairy producers, how many of you have a research and development team on your farm? Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Um, and so for a lot of, uh, informally at least, uh, for this reason, we've sort of functioned in that way, not we alone in dairy science, but the College of Ag has functioned in that research and development role. And things that everybody does every day on the farm, how to treat ketosis, uh, teat dipping uh, uh, of cows after milking, somatic cell count as a management tool, as a genetic tool, uh, embryo transfer, um, a lot of Bob Rowe's work when he was a graduate student um, on embryo transfer and non-surgical and all those sorts of things and, and countless more. So that's one point. We want to keep doing this, okay? Um, another point is a lot of this stuff didn't happen uh, just in the Department of Dairy Science. Not every problem is a cow biology problem. Uh, historically, a lot of the great discoveries were biochemists, microbiologists working on dairy problems and so we want to leverage those opportunities. A uh, great um, example I use of this is our colleague Garrett Suen in bacteriology, great young scientist. I went to one of his seminars last spring, and he spent half of his seminar talking about the dairy cow rumen and the microbes, and he spent the other half talking about the tree sloth, because I don't remember the details. Heather can explain it to you, but there's something weird about their digestive system that is also interesting, um, like a cow is interesting, right? Well, I would rather have him work on dairy problems. I'm pretty sure all of you would, but if he gets funding to work on dairy problems, he'll do that. If he gets funding from National Science Foundation to work on sloths, he'll work on sloths. So we need to help steer these people in the right direction. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities like that. There are brilliant scientists all over campus who invented uh, new hammers and they're looking for a nail. And when we come along with a nail, they can't wait to, to hammer it, right? But we have to present those opportunities, okay? Um, what else is relevant right now? Um, you know, as, as well as things are going in terms of some of the ag policy uh, that was discussed by our last speaker, not so much in higher education right now. And one of the things that most of us in this room would be um, happy about is if, if everyone said, well, dairy is so important in agriculture that higher education cuts should come only at 
Parkside or Superior, or if it's at Madison, they should cut anthropology. I mean, Cro-Magnon man's been dead for a couple million years. What's the difference, right? Um, cut philosophy, East Asian studies. You want to learn about China? Buy a plane ticket, right? Um, but that's not how it works. And so we want to make sure we can continue to deliver these discoveries. But we also want to do two other things uh, that Heather will talk about, which is make them quicker, instead of 10 years to market, maybe five years. And then the other thing is to make them uh, sort of more pro provincial, if you will. So we actually have negotiated with Wharf a, a way that we can um, get some preferential benefit for those who get involved early on, whether it's as a group of farmers or as DBA in general or whatever, so that when a new technology becomes available, it isn't available at the same day, on the same day at the same price to a farmer in Texas or Australia as for a farmer here in Wisconsin if it's invented here, okay? So what kind of things do we do in research? We develop physical uh, products, some examples from the last slide, egg yolk buffer for semen extenders and uh, artificial insemination, diagnostic tests like NIR to measure fiber digestibility, management tools. So, you know, how do I do limit feeding of replacement heifers? This is Pat Hoffman stuff, Dave Combs here, uh, Victor Cabrera, things like uh, software management tools, calculating retention payoff of keeping or culling a cow or value of getting her pregnant versus not uh, keeping that animal. Uh, physiological mechanisms, a lot of things that Heather do, some can result in products, some result in us just understanding what's going on, okay? And the products come next. Uh, a good example of this I'll hit on another slide is, is Obsync, right? So if you don't know how the hormones work uh, in, the, in the reproductive cycle, uh, then you're kind of out of luck, right? And technical consultants, so by our count, about 600 masters and PhD grads over the past two generations have come into the dairy industry. And, and so different kinds of products, and some of these can be licensed, patented, obviously some cannot, some might lead to things later, and so on. A Couple examples, the, the sort of easiest one um, that everybody knows about here is, is Milo Wiltbank's work on Ovsync. Probably everybody here is using pre-sync, Ovsync, double Ovsync, kitchen sink, something on your farm like that. And you know, this was 10 years of work uh, that was hard to find funding, nobody wanted to fund it, um, didn't think it's going to work, and so on. Other people have tried uh, until about the last year, and then everybody wants to fund it, right, because it's going to work. Uh, but, but by Victor's calculations, so Victor Cabrera, it's about $58 million a year uh, it's bringing to Wisconsin dairy farmers in terms of higher pregnancy rate, lower cull rate for repro, all those sorts of things, and it halted a 50-year decline in pregnancy rate in high-producing dairy cows. Uh, Larry Satter's work over here. Um, nobody wants their lake or pond to look like this, right? Or a river. So how do you make the ration cheaper in terms of not buying phosphorus you don't need? And then what are the environmental implications? Uh, some of my own stuff here, taking a technology like uh, DNA microarrays, making them cheaper by figuring out how to do genotype imputation. Uh, 30,000 calves being tested every month now. So. Uh, these things are happening, and, and the next generation will continue uh, of, of new products and tools and technologies. And the last thing I'll mention is, is the sort of human capital side of it. This is a picture from Pam Ruig. She was out on a commercial farm, I don't even remember which one, and uh, involved in uh, the management team meeting and looking around going, every one of you is a graduate of our uh, master's or PhD program, okay? Uh, some domestic students, some international. One misconception, I think, is that we have a lot of international students. Um, that part isn't necessarily a misconception, but they come here, learn everything, and go back home. Um, that's only true for those who are on government scholarships who require them to go back home. Almost all others stay and contribute to, to our industry. In fact, my last international PhD student, Saleh, was from Iran. You know, last thing he wants to do is go back home. Right? He'll do anything but to, to not go back home working at Alta Genetics, and so uh, the human capital that's developed as sort of a side product are, are your nutritionists and repro reproductive management technologists and, and so on. So I think uh, my time is up, and I will pass on to the younger and better looking uh, professor in our department. Well, thank you, Ken. I'm breaking the rules again. She can tell you how this all patched. Yeah, so Normally when I stand up here and I see familiar faces, I'm talking about ketosis or I've been at your farm, I've been at several of your farms and I'm doing research and I'm showing you some big scary biochemistry diagram and asking you not to panic this early in the morning and walking you through it. 
But today I wanna to share with you how we get that done. So a little bit about how we start or continue or support a research lab. Uh, much like you guys, we're our own small business. We have to bring in money, we have to bring in people, we have to manage those people, and we have to accomplish our objectives uh, and stay competitive. So thinking of it that way, we have a lot of common goals. So this time last year, the department, 95% uh, of them, uh, went on this really great trip to this place called Spain with Lloyd and, and Daphne Holderman. And I couldn't go. I had already volunteered to speak at a producer meeting. I think I, uh, I think I should have looked at the calendar a little closer. No, but one of the great things was I got to be here at the First Dairy Strong and have a booth here for uh, our department talking to you guys, recruiting uh, students and so on. And I sat next to uh, Jim Hodge from Baird and we started talking about this very question. How do I support research? How do I fund students? How do I get this done? And it led to this year long process where we've been talking to a lot of people and now want to put some brainstorming thoughts in front of you. So let's answer that. How do I get that done? Well, assumably, I have a bright idea one day. I wake up, drinking my coffee at five in the morning, I think, aha, this is how to fix transition cow metabolic problems, right? So then I do some preliminary research. Now, to do this, I have to have money, right? We all know doing things takes money. So I have some money maybe I've scrounged together from gift funds or from uh, you know, a grant that I can kind of do a side project off of with pennies. And I find a student who's willing to work for me for free. And so I have a little bit of money. And I get this preliminary data. And then I use that to submit a proposal, which I hope will result in more data so that I can do the whole project. But oftentimes we have to revise and resubmit because of funding rates uh, for federal grants, which I'll touch on in just a second. So then we continue to do the work. Maybe we go to some more farms or we do some more experiments. And then we do, in fact, succeed at getting funded. And we can address this big question that we're trying to do, whether it has to do with genomics or fatty liver uh, or ketosis. And so then we recruit one of these bright young minds, one of these students that will work with us as a graduate student. And graduate students, as many of you know, take some classes, but mostly they're full-time researchers for us. And so they're helping us work through these experiments and they're learning along the way. And so then we do our series of experiments, some of which are out on commercial dairies uh, with you guys, some of which are at the university farms. Uh, we have great infrastructure here at the university to do that. And then we come up with some solutions. Maybe we submit a patent. We certainly submit uh, the research to be published. We present it at extension meetings or producer meetings. And then if we're, we're lucky, we find an interested company who wants to really help uh, develop it into a product. So like with the OvSync in that last year, we find somebody who wants to uh, help us take it the last step. And then some of our either previous or currently trained students help us by being out in the field on the technical side implementing uh, that new information or the new tool or protocol. But this is a long process. As you see, this is a nine-year timeline. That's, as it says in the bottom, a best case scenario. So one of the things that we are always interested in doing is becoming more efficient. Just like we're trying to help cows get more efficient, we would certainly like to do the same. And so I want to show you what I think are maybe some of the weak links to this. The first one is where do we get our funding? Okay, so I'm not talking about the little dollars. I'm talking about where do we get enough money to do one of these large projects that results in a low density chip or a ketosis tool or um, an off sync kind of thing. The main one and historically what we've built our research programs on is federal competition. So USDA uh, or NIH, NSF type funds. The problem with these or the challenge is that they're extremely competitive. Uh, between six and 10% of grants get funded. So to be in that six or 10%, you have to have a lot of the work done to prove that it's going to work. So the example with OvSync that Kent gave earlier, in the very early stage, no one wants to invest in something that still needs some proof of concept or still needs some proving. They want you to have solid evidence that you're onto something big. So you pretty much have to have a lot of that done. So maybe an analogy is, well, I work with transition cows a lot and I tell you, maybe you need to improve your cow comfort in your maternity pen. So you want to get the funding to do that, but you have to prove that's going to help. Well, how do you do that? Go ahead and install five of the good pins 
and then we'll know it works and we'll help you fund the six you need. Right? So there's a little bit of disconnect in when that money comes in the timeline. The other area is corporate sponsors and uh, as far as corporate goes, they're very supportive in helping answer questions that are mutually of interest to us and them. But again, because of their structure and their research budgets, which are limited as, as just as ours are, you know, again, we've got to do a lot of that work so that they know it's going to be a sound investment on their part or something that they can, in fact, develop. So those are two of the strategies we've used in the past. And part of the reason it takes a long time to get to the point where we're actually recruiting a student and starting the research. The other weak link is that down here on implementing on the farm, there's equal access and cost to farms here in Wisconsin and to a farm in Florida. Okay, why does that matter? You guys need to stay competitive, right? You need to stay on the leading edge in order to have that advantage. And you've already invested in the infrastructure, right? You've invested in the taxes it takes to have a great university in the state and to have us there so that investment, if you will, is diluted out a little when you, like Keith, for example, get access to a tool that I work on the same time somebody in New Mexico or Florida does, and they didn't invest in getting me here and getting me started like you guys did. So that's one of the things that we think we could improve on if we're able to shift up this, uh, the way that we're funding things at this point. All right, so back to what you need to be successful. If we talk about sustainable competitive advantage, so what's it take to make you better uh, if we talk about your farm, but then also as a state, our dairy industry better? You need tools, you need resources, and you need knowledge that puts you a step ahead of everyone else. So you must have continual access to new innovations, and that's some place that I think our department and our university has really helped with uh, in terms of a lot of things. Certainly a lot of that comes directly from the industry as well. And you must be able to implement those innovations faster than competitors. That's the part we can't give you right now because when we do something funded by the USDA, all of that data is free and it's free to you at the same time it's free to someone in Florida. Back to that example. So we can't give you that part of the competitive advantage at this point. The other thing is with needing it faster, can we trim that timeline down to three or four years? Can we remove that upfront investment of time so that as soon as we have that great idea, we're working on the solution. We're not spending three or four years convincing people that that's what we need to be working on, okay? And then again, can we create an advantage for you folks as Wisconsin producers, uh, getting you early access to the information you need? And one of the things uh, is with the wharf at the University of Wisconsin-Madison that deals with patents and licensable material. We've actually spent quite a bit of time talking to them about would this be possible and protecting that IP and getting it to you guys sooner. Uh, and they've been very supportive and helpful. All right, so if we could reduce that, we would need early stage research funding. We would need some funding right after this bright idea uh, where we could get the funding to do that research, recruit the personnel, and get started so that we get to this point where we're implementing on Wisconsin dairies earlier, faster, better. Okay, so that's where we think we could streamline this and work through that process much quicker, maybe in half the time. All right, so that early stage funding, this is high, uh, potentially high risk, potentially very high reward, right? This is funding things before 90% of it's done and getting to the answers quicker or maybe deciding that it's not a path we want to go down. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. But what's happening in other commodities? Do we see any of this other places just looking around? Uh, especially to me, I've been here almost three years. When I looked around, what did I see? Uh, the Wisconsin Cranberries and Wisconsin Potato Associations both fund faculty positions and have annual research competitions. So they're focused on keeping that money in Wisconsin and then getting answers to those producers quicker. Uh, corn and soybean associations both have annual research competitions as well. What do we see in other states? So I've been a few other universities before um, I ended up here through schooling and then getting started my research program. Here's just a couple of examples, certainly not to exhaustion, Michigan State, uh, their industry or their uh, producers provide more than $600,000 in grants to Michigan State each year. 
Uh, and the state legislature also has added a number of different faculty positions that are supported by the industry. At the University of Florida, we actually sent two of our very recent PhD um, graduates have now faculty positions at the University of Florida, so they have two of our recent uh, graduates, and they have about $250,000 a year in grants from the, uh, what's maybe like a milk checkoff program. Okay, so considering the size of their dairy industry, that's quite the contribution. And then they also have some state legislature that helps with ag-specific faculty positions. Uh, in the state of Nebraska, they fund research, scholarships, and faculty positions. And perhaps the most recent example is Cornell, who went through um, a similar set of cutbacks as we've been going through. Uh, and they went to the industry and they said, we don't have any way to replace our nutritionist. We need a dairy nutritionist. Will you help us fund that position? And they were actually able to get enough funding to do two endowed faculty positions. So the industry has committed to supporting those two folks, which they're recruiting for now. So we certainly see this going on in other states and in other commodity groups. All right, so what kind of thing would work? Not every great idea is an off sink, right? We all know that. Just like every great idea on farm isn't the most successful. Sometimes we have to reevaluate and step back. So a uh, progressive phase model is what we often use in our research. So when we're collecting preliminary data, sometimes we get to that preliminary point and we say, okay, that one's probably not going to work out. It's probably not going to get federal funding, for example. But a lot of times we keep working towards it because we know that it could be something great. The same kind of thing could be done in this type of situation where we have maybe phase one funding, early stage exploratory type research. These are things that would be $100,000 projects to get a student in there. So this would train a master's student. It would get at the research and get the preliminary data to see if it's a feasible solution to pursue. If it is, then maybe it goes on to a phase two research. Okay? In phase two, this is the next step, which would get something near or to commercialization. So this is the part of the research that takes more money, maybe about $600,000, but would get the research to the point where it is an OVSYNC or it is a commercialized product that's available to you guys. All right, so what's the big picture? I just wanna put it in perspective. This is just an example. Um, to show what kind of impact we could have in the state. The governor spent a lot of time talking about how big the dairy industry was in our state, right? So this is just an example that shows how big of an impact that could extrapolate to. If we talk about one penny per hundred weight of milk, okay? One penny per hundred weight of milk in this state is about $2.8 million a year, all right? That $2.8 million, if we think of it in context of these products and research and students that we're training that become technical experts in the field, that could be maybe 10 of those phase one grants, those early high risk, potentially high return grants, okay? And three progressive phase two grants that would be about 600,000, okay? Those may last three or four years and I'm just lumping it all into one here for my loose little example. Maybe those other seven projects that don't go on to phase two could lead to federal funding. We certainly do not want to stop tapping into bringing in federal money into our state. Um, it could uh, result in industry funding. Okay, so companies who may see it and want to help fund it. Or maybe reevaluating and doing a new approach. We all do that every day, right? We decide something's not really the best way to do it. But at any rate, that funding in one year, uh, you know, and then played out over the next few years could train 10 master students that become uh, employees of companies that are coming out to your, fee or to your farm. They may become your nutritionist or your consultant or they may work with you day to day. Uh, maybe they work with your veterinarians. Three PhD students, okay? We have a lot of PhD consultants that are on dairies every day in the state. Uh, and then three new technologies or tools. I'm not counting the seven that we didn't progress in that year. Three new things that become a ketosis recommendation or an off sync or a genomic SNP chip tool, okay? And then we also have gotten faster answers and improvements uh, in questions that are relevant. And that's another area we think this could really help is that there would be opportunities for stakeholder input early on. So we're not on farm and in the field day in and day out like some of us used to be and like you guys are. But this model would give you a chance to tell us what questions you need answered, 
okay? So that we can make sure that our research is staying relevant and focused for solutions that are needed. And then again, getting that competitive advantage back to you earlier uh, so that you can stay competitive and get the answers and tools that you need. All right, so in summary, uh, we have done really well with our current model. As Kent showed that slide, we've really had a large impact from our department, but from others at the university. We bring in right now for every $1 of tax support that you guys are already invested in the infrastructure, we bring in six and a half dollars of federal or outside money to match that with. So we're bringing in funds to help with research. But with that comes a long timeline and equal access uh, to folks all over the country and the world. And so if we can uh, make this process a little more efficient, we think that we could achieve common goals between you folks and us as well. At any rate, major reinvestment is certainly needed to revitalize dairy research and to keep it going strong so that we can stay at the top uh, and that you guys can stay competitive. So again, quicker flow from ideal to application, opportunities for stakeholder input early on in the game when we're first getting those ideas or first thinking about those questions, and then competitive advantage for producers here in the state. So with that, as Kent said, we'll uh, talk about the things we're good at. And we've met a lot of people in the last year that understand more about finance than I. Uh, when I first met Jim, I said, I don't have wealth to manage, I have debt. I don't know what you want to talk to me for. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Michael, and, and he knows a little bit more about that terminology than certainly I did. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, good morning. So uh, yeah, my modest task here is to kind of give you the intro to angel investment, and angel funding in less than five minutes. So we're going to kind of cover a lot of material quickly. I'm going to speak mostly to the kind of the next slide, and you have handouts in front of you. Uh, and kind of who I am and how I got here. So I'm a Wisconsin native, uh, did my undergrad in engineering at Marquette, was an active duty army officer overseas, and then spent the better part of a, a decade in Silicon Valley. So uh, I often describe myself as kind of a recovering software engineer. So the concepts we're gonna kind of touch on, and generally speaking, you know, I think the prevailing media narrative around startups is about a couple of kids in a dorm room starting a software startup, right? So that is the prevailing need it, narrative, excuse me, but the Kaufman research will tell you that most entrepreneurs or small business owners are in their late 30s, early 40s that start businesses and are successful. Um, so around angel investment generally, so angel investors and kind of by default, the state of Wisconsin is actually one of the most successful angel investment markets in the country. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that's because we don't really have much venture capital. There's opinions vary on how much venture capital there is in the state, but by the Silicon Valley definition where they have uh, you know, dozens of firms in the billions of dollars. Venture investors in the state is one of the largest, has roughly raised a fund of about 100 million. There's a few other firms in the dozens of millions, so there's kind of one and a half to two and a half what would be considered traditional venture capital firms. But there's two very um, large and uh, angel investment groups, so Wisconsin Investment Partners in Madison and the Marquette Golden Angels uh, based out of Milwaukee and pretty closely associated with the university. So they're literally among the most active angel investors in the country, right? So that's the good news where that, that tradition and the, the kind of experience of angel investment in the state, there's a fit for the kind of the concepts. But the, the, the challenges are these concepts are more traditional around agriculture products than, or excuse me, around technology investments and products than agriculture, but the opportunities are still there. So angel investors are typically working uh, professionals that have that do it as kind of a, a very intense hobby. Uh, they might anywhere, they'll be part of a group, they might invest anywhere from five to $25,000, sometimes more. Um, a company comes in, presents, the group might invest um, a lump sum, 50, 100, 250, sometimes it's even been 500, and uh, as a group, and then kind of within the group, they fill that amount. There's a lot of different ways it's done, but uh, the, the challenge there as a startup is it's a longer decision cycle, it takes longer, you're, you're dealing with people that it, they, they meet once a month or it's not their profession versus a, a traditional venture capital firm, that's all they do. When they decide to act, they act. They have commitments from typically institutional investors, so they don't need to go get approval or kind of pass the hat to raise money. So um, that kind of gets through the angel fund. Uh, Brom Dalmans is here. So Brom, he works for the Wisconsin Technology Council, so there, some of you might be familiar with them. Uh, Tom still leads that group. He does where he writes in the State Journal and the Journal Sentinel um, a few times a month, uh, primarily around technology issues. 
but they're kind of the leading trade association for angel and venture capital in the state. Um, Wisconsin's also been very successful with uh, crowdfunding. We're one of the first states, I think the second state, to pass a crowdfunding law several years ago. Um, that's the good news. The challenge is it hasn't really been acted on. Like crowdfunding in a lot of ways, it's the Wild West. Um, but those concepts are applicable um, for the opportunities that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about. So as a picture, um, so venture capital is kind of the more traditional. Uh, this is where Wisconsin really has a lot of challenges. It doesn't have many funds. Uh, where we're more active are the angel groups or super angels or think of somebody who's had a substantial exit or writes much, much bigger checks or it's almost like a one person venture capital firm. Um, and as you'd expect, this, these are larger amounts, typically closer to, you know, out here is the IPO, out here is a company with a product and revenue and established customer channels. So there's more knowns and it's, it's typically called growth capital to grow quickly. As you move further along here, it's earlier stage and more risk and more often substantially more risk. So your typical venture capital firm if they, of whatever amount, if they make 10 investments, seven of those uh, within a five or seven year fund are gonna be vaporized. Because uh, they're, they're trying to make investments with businesses all have 20X or better returns. Seven of them typically are gonna fail. One of them will be you know, a flat or a positive exit. One of them will be a, a, a double or triple, uh, you know, a two or a three X win. And one of them needs to be that 20X or better to deliver their returns to, to their investors to beat the, the benchmarks that they compete against to attract capital. Angel, investor, uh, angel groups are typically similar, um, but they, they often have less exits, they're more risk. And the concepts we're talking about for, for uh, the Dairy Angel idea, it, it even predates this, right? So angel groups typically only invest when there's been an SBIR grant, when there's a company formed around a concept or a patentable concept. So, uh, you know, the, the challenge here is what we're talking about even kind of predates the traditional approaches and models. Uh, but the good news is we actually have some traditions here and some opportunities around it um, that mean it could work. Um, and again, what we're trying to do today is this is the beginning of a, uh, it's, it's the result of a discussion that started between the uh, Dairy Science Department and uh, Jim Hodge from Baird and his colleague Stacy's here. So Baird, this isn't traditionally what they do, but a lot of his business is being an investment advisor. He's actually a, uh, a farmer in Janesville. Uh, grew up on a farm. He and his wife both run a farm. The wife farm, family runs a farm. He got Baird as a day job when the family was kind of between farms. So he's in your industry, lives it. Um, I'm not, but I'm, I'm more familiar with this than, than kind of the Baird team is. Um, so around Act 255, which you might have heard, but one of the, and this, this is a law that passed five years ago in Wisconsin that's been copied by a lot of other states, and it's one of the reasons that Wisconsin's more successful with angel capital. Uh, the short version is any investment you make in a startup, there's a 25% um, of that amount is a tax credit on your state income taxes. So that's helped get a lot of people a lot more action and more capital moving, but again, the challenge there relative to the concept we're talking about here is that's into an entity that controls the intellectual property that would be a company, where what we're talking about is still a little bit early stage there. Right? So that's the bad news. The good news is we do have some models around a double bottom line approach. Right? And again, it's unique within the country. What we're talking about, I haven't seen anywhere else in the country, but um, until two years ago, this didn't exist. So Bright Star Foundation, if you might have read in the paper, it's, it's got an approach called double bottom line. So they're an investment fund. They're making their, their traditional actor in how they're selecting investments and supporting early stage companies. But their double bottom line is instead of, um, John Moorridge as an example, gave a $100 million challenge match gift to the university. Well, if you go to that same you know, Silicon Valley investor to, fund, to make an investment into a venture capital fund, Wisconsin doesn't offer the kind of opportunities that will attract that. Right? That doesn't make it through his investment team. But that's still somebody who wrote a nine figure check to the university. So the, the very clever approach that Brightstar came up with is approaching that same network of wealthy, uh, charitable people in Wisconsin to make those investments into what's essentially a venture capital fund to help make investments and grow jobs in the state. So they made it as a charitable donation. It's not a, for them, it's not an investment. The fund runs itself as an investment and it basically evergreens. Any money that's made is plowed back into the fund to reinvest in Wisconsin companies. And the double bottom line there is to encourage jobs and research and development, right? So again, that concept is here. They got the 501c3 status, the nonprofit status in the IRS 18 months or two years ago. And literally, again, this is an example of it had never been done before. It's being done in Wisconsin. It's the first place in the country it's been done. 
And that's a model, it's a concept that works for what we're talking about. Um, so how it might work, we kind of touched on some of this. I won't speak to all this because we actually want to leave time for questions. Um, and I'll jump through uh, a lot of this. But again, it kind of goes back to what we're talking about conceptually is angel investors um, and the you know, buzzwords make my eyes glaze over, business model foremost among them. But ultimately, what you need for this to work is a channel of customers, right? So a lot of what startup accelerators do, it's about customer discovery. So the fact that you're actually dairy farmers willing to invest in research that's meaningful to you to impact your business means you don't have to be you know, a unicorn, if you've heard of the term. You know, it doesn't need to be Airbnb or Uber or put a few million dollars in and get a $40 billion valuation you know, within a couple of years. That's not the way that investment cycle has to work to attract capital. That's not the way it would work here. Um, so yeah, in summary, uh, I think it, angel investments, typically the spark to help make things happen because you all know your industry better than any of us. We can kind of help with the investment principles that help. And Baird's been a great, uh, <coughs> excuse me, partner and sponsor for what we're doing. And angel investor, or your potential participation is key to drive other players. So the Tech Council, as an example, the Trades Association, they're here, they're very interested in, in helping nurture this. You've got a, a governor and a legislature and administration and WDC, they're all very eager to help this um, in any way, shape, or form and help your industry. But the problem is it's, it's witchcraft, right? There aren't always very obvious answers about where to deploy capital, what levers to push or pull, because in some instances, you're kind of creating the, you're building the plane as you fly it. Um, so with that said too, and uh, the handouts were all printed by Baird. Baird was the original catalyst for this. Uh, Jim Hodge is actually traveling, but I want to introduce his colleague and teammate Stacy um, from Baird, and I'll kind of head off there. Hello, everybody. I will take 30 seconds here and just make some a quick introduction and some closing comments. Uh, thank you all for joining us at this session today. Obviously, it's a little bit unusual for, for what you're used to at this type of conference, but um, as Michael uh, just mentioned my business partner, Jim Hodge, and I were here uh, last year for this conference. Uh, Jim has a long history. He's actually a fifth generation farmer in Janesville. And so he has a lot of interest firsthand in uh, the business that you all are involved with. Uh, so Jim and I have really been over the last 12 months the f kind of making the connections uh, with the angel investors and the dairy business group, uh, the dairy science uh, department, and facilitating the conversations between those folks and really trying to push this idea forward. Uh, we made a lot of progress last year, and we are uh, certainly to hope, uh, hopeful of making a lot more progress uh, in 2016. And our contact information is in each of the handouts. Uh, we would love to take uh, questions from you. I know we're running a little bit late on time, but I am gonna open it up for uh, questions if that's okay, Rebecca. Uh, but if you have any specific questions on how to get involved or if you know people who would be interested in getting involved, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to either myself or Jim Hodge. We would welcome uh, your comments, questions, or interest. And with that, I will open it to questions. Okay. Oh, and, and with that too, so the rosters we put on your tables, uh, feel free to fill that out if you're interested in kind of connecting with us and staying involved with whatever this kind of turns out being. But, you know, to be clear, um, the Department of Financial Institutions. This is not a solicitation for investment or securities or you know all those qualifications. This is a, a, a concept we're working towards. Yeah, and certainly Baird would love to disclose that because this is um, not their traditional business. But again, they're in the financial advisory. A big part of their business is working with uh, dairy farmers and family-owned businesses, and this complements what they do. They've been uh, a key partner to help move this along, <coughs> and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so I think what we would like. Go ahead. Thank you. 
So I, I guess the comment I'd add there, so uh, I can't speak to your industry, right? That's not my experience. But I can say in, in our experience around similar concepts, um, and again, an administration and a legislature that's very eager to do things around innovation and support, um, help inject innovation into its most important industries. I think there would be support there, but that would only happen if there's a way to, it's gotta be kind of crowdsourced or groundswell, it's gotta come from this channel, right? If you guys want that to happen, yeah, I have little, mechanism. yeah, I have little doubt that there would be support for that and structures to help support, um, you know, channeling those funds towards this kind of structure, yeah. right? So everything from the tech council, lobbying on this kind of thing is what they do for a living through WDC, through those other groups, they would all, you know, but it's really gotta come from interest in this channel among you. Thanks. Good question. I would suspect this would be perhaps a program best suited to be part of Brightstar. It's an existing platform. That double bottom line concept is there. Um, candidly, like the 1% the, the per weight is a great conceptually, but I don't necessarily, you know, again, to be candid, I don't think all the money has to kind of come from the industry. Those other players are eager to have an efficient place to put capital to help nurture these kind of things. So. If that one percent, as the example, you know, produce that kind of capital, that would at least be matched by other players, and to become a meaningful platform. And at five million, that's kind of the, probably the minimum critical mass to make something like this really get started. You know, as a, you know, let's call it an experiment. Um, I know the scientists resist that concept, but um, but that's very realistic. And to your point, I think it's more likely to be. Uh, it's less likely to be an angel investor group, right? So back to the chart. This is kind of so. Er early stage conceptually, or with Wharf as an example. Wharf would be, you know, if whatever amount of investment interest might come from this channel would almost certainly be matched by Wharf, you know, or a similar play it, or, or SWIB, and so all of a sudden you get one or two or three X, but the important player is the interest from the channel and from the experts, because it, you're gonna know more about helping select the research projects, or back to kind of the business model as a startup accelerator, you're an existing customer channel. so. If the customers are already kind of buying the product, that removes lots of risk, you know, that's that's cascaded through the system and attracts more capital into it. So, and so back to your question too. So is it individual investors or is it a nonprofit? It's, it's probably a blend of both. Um, so Wharf just won, and I forget, 300 million against Apple, right? They are the original concept of a tech transfer office, a patent engine. Um, this is rounding error, you know, for them in a lot of ways. It's almost, it's not too small for them to pay attention, but it's, it needs to get critical mass for it to be a project within Wharf. But where, again, I'm kind of a newer player to the, to the the concept here, but where they are with Wharf, it's very telling that Wharf kind of pre-negotiated an exclusive 90-day first look for whatever this is to get first crack at organizing that before Wharf comes in, right? But then uh, back to the, an angel investor, if I'm an angel investor looking at investing in basic research that Wharf can kind of cherry pick what they want or Wharf with their machines gonna come in at the end, that freaks me out, right? That's not, that's where it gets back to, it's gotta be um, an industry expert or you need to kind of invest in this for your business because it's doing something real for you now, right? So it kind of gets back to, there are other models that make it a fit, but somewhere in there is a blend of, you know, there's a real opportunity in there, it's just not obvious what, how that's structured yet. 
All right, thank you. Unfortunately, we're running yeah, short on time, but can I please get a round of applause for our presenters today? Right, there's handouts on the table to take. Yep. And also, just want to remind you, we, we're looking for survey back. So on your app, there is a form you can fill out, or they do have forms at the registration desk for the whole conference here to provide feedback. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.